Hello everybody and welcome to the December Virtual Planetarium with Pete Lawrence and me Paul Abel and as ever we will start with our inner solar system and work outwards and the planet Mercury, well fairly low down, uh, it starts off uh, being an evening object uh, on the 4th of December separating from the sun by around 21 degrees shining at magnitude minus 0.3 and setting but an hour after the sun so that's not too bad but then fades in brightness and then becomes harder to see till it reaches inferior conjunction on the 22nd of December and thereafter returns to the morning sky but it's going to be quite a challenge to see it I think it is it's very low down I mean it's um, on the 31st of December uh, an hour before sunrise, it's only about three degrees up, which is pretty, pretty <laughs> low. <laughs> the best Venus, of course, isn't such a tricky thing. Venus is a really dominant morning object at the moment, shining at magnitude minus four point one on at the beginning of December. It's um, up for or it it arises fractionally over four hours before the sun comes up, and that's good because it gives it about two hours in totally astronomically dark skies so you can see it against a really dark sky and that makes it look really impressive doesn't it it does it really does look like some the landing lights of a, of a large aircraft it is quite <laughs> a brilliant sight uh, of course telescopically that's the worst time to look at it because yes, it is. it's so bright. You it, it will disc, it will mask all the details. Uh, it's much better to view it in a in the dusk or the dawn sky, uh, where where the brightness of the background sky uh, turns down some of that brilliance. Um, You're never happy, are you? I'm never happy. I'm just very picky about observing Venus. Um, at the start <laughs> of December, though, Spica, the bright star in Virgo, lies four and a half degrees southwest of Venus, and at the beginning of December. December, the phase is about 67% lit, so it's a waxing gibbous, uh, and the phase is getting quite large now, and 17 arc seconds across, so not too small, really. No, but it, it is a tricky planet to get the detail out of, I think, as we, we've said many times before. It's an even harder planet to get any detail out will be Mars, yes. because it's not <laughs> visible this month. No, so uh, we'll pass over Mars and onto the planet Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is still very well placed as an evening planet. It came to opposition last month, and so now it's still well placed in the evening sky. And also very bright, minus 2.7 magnitude. That is very bright, yes. Can't mistake that, can you? So uh, no. still very bright and still high up, uh, 50 degrees up due south as seen from the centre of the UK um, so quite quite an impressive height and very very unmistakable in the night sky yeah and Saturn also is reasonably well placed at the start of December visible at its highest altitude due south under almost true dark sky conditions it's about 24 degrees up at that time However, by the time we've got to the end of the month, Saturn's peak altitude occurs when the sun is still above the horizon, mm. unfortunately. So that means that by the time the sky is getting darker, Saturn is losing altitude and it's dropping into the murky, really disturbed, uh, wobbly bit of the atmosphere, <laughs> which will hide a lot of the detail. Yeah, so uh, this is really becoming the last month, really, we can observe Saturn uh, before it gets too low. Uh, moving out, we have the ice giants, um, and Uranus is very well placed in the evening sky now. Um, it reached opposition in the middle of November, and it reaches an altitude of 54 degrees under truly dark skies, as seen from the centre of the UK, for most of the month, if not all of the month, and shining at magnitude plus 5.6, um, and not far from the star Delta Ariatis, it's quite easy to find and quite a bright object if you've got a small telescope. And quite unmistakable. I find the greenish hue of Uranus very, very distinctive. Yes, it's very obvious with a, a telescope. It's actually quite impressive. Not so obvious through uh, binoculars, though. It just no. looks like a white star then. Yes, it does. Yeah, you definitely need a, a bit of power. Uh, and I've used, I've seen details, vague, faint details with my 18-inch telescope on Uranus. So now I've got my larger 12-inch telescope. You you can see a sort of brighter polar region and a, and a bit of dark band, but the sky conditions have to be really quite good. You need good seeing for that. Yes, they do. Yeah. 
And the same with Neptune, really. Neptune is even harder um, and has a bluish hue. Um, but it's an evening planet well placed at the beginning of the month, like the previous two. But it deteriorates slightly towards the end of the month. And on the 1st of December, Neptune shines at magnitude plus 7.9. So you'll need binoculars to see it. But it does manage an altitude of 34 degrees when due south, which is, is not too bad, really, for Neptune. So if you get good seeing, have a go at Neptune see what you can pick out. Yes, and some amateurs have been uh, using uh, their imaging technology to pull out some interesting details, storms on the on, in the planet's atmosphere. So yes. Uranus and Neptune aren't quite as inert as we believe them to be. It's always worth observing them. Absolutely right. OK, well, let's move on to our special events section, and we'll start with the, uh, the 9th of December, when there's a reasonable liberation for spotting the Mare Orientale. That's the... The Eastern Sea, which, as I think we've mentioned before, is on the <laughs> western side of the moon. But it's an impressive area of the moon to look for if you've got a telescope. Um, so just scan that region, see what features you can pick out. You probably won't be able to see it as a, a big sea. Uh, you'll see it very foreshortened because it's right on the edge of the moon. But the, the best way to pick out the detail is either to image it or to sketch it and then have a look at it afterwards and just try and decode what it is you've recorded. Yeah, in fact, that's a good way of doing many lunar features, isn't it? Is to make a, a proper observation of it, uh, either an image or a drawing, and then try and work out what it is you've been looking at, identify the features in your observation. Uh, I, I think that'll stick with you more, the lunar features and how what they look like and the names of them is... That will stay with you more than just trying to memorise a, a lunar chart, I think. Oh, and without any doubt. And, of course, if you're sketching, it's you're not biased when you're making the record because you're just recording the region and then you're trying to decode it afterwards. Yes, absolutely. So uh, a few things there to, 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 to try for the Mare Orientale. Um, on the 12th, we have a nice event. This is Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede, is occulted by the planet. This starts at 1957 UT, so that's when Ganymede will appear to disappear behind Jupiter, and it will reappear on the other side at 2155 UT. And the interesting thing about the uh, about Ganymede going behind Jupiter is how long it takes to pass through the atmosphere as it's going behind the planet. Yes. It could take, it could take a, a more than 30 seconds, I've found, and the, the, the shape, the colour of Ganymede changes as it passes through the upper atmosphere of Jupiter, which is, is quite interesting to study. Yes, it is. Yes, absolutely. On the 13th, we've got the earliest sunset of the year. I'm sure you're looking forward to that, Paul. I am, providing it's clear. Otherwise, it's a completely <laughs> pointly, completely pointless early sunset otherwise, isn't it? Yeah. Um, on the 14th, we have something very nice. This is the Geminid meteor shower. It's peaking in the evening. So it's worth doing an all-night watch because the conditions are going to be good. Uh, the theoretical peak occurs early in the evening this time. It's uh, 7 in the evening. But the geometry and timing of, uh, of the watch means that really it's best time to look is on the 13th of the 14th and the 14th of the 15th of December. So uh, a couple of nights to watch out for. And the Geminids can produce some bright and a lot of activity. They're very so good. So this is a shower. They are. This is a really good shower to, to try and observe. Well, the, the best thing about the Geminids is you get 12 hours um, when of darkness where you can just sit outside and observe them. And they have a, a peak, ZHR, I think it's about 120 metres per hour, which is excellent. And they, they really fail to deliver actually it's only if the if the moon's about or um the weather is not good that you don't get a good display of geminids but they are pretty good and of course they're called geminids because when peak activity occurs the radiant that's the point in the sky where the meteors trails appear to emanate from is in gemini it's really close to the star castor which is alpha geminorum um, the peak is broad as well, which also helps because with things like the quadrantids in early January and the persids in August, the peak tends to be quite narrow. But with the geminids, it's a bit broader. So you get a bit more activity, heightened activity for longer. Yes, so this will be a, a good one to watch out for. And it's, if you can find the time to go and get some dark skies and go and observe these meteors, that sh the Gemini meteor shower, that, that would be well worth doing. Don't forget to wrap up warm, though, because it does get very cold in December. <laughs> yes. 
Okay, on the 17th, uh, another Jupiter moon event, uh, Callisto. This is the uh, outermost of the four Galilean moons, sits below Jupiter's southern pole at 2149. That's uh, 2149 UT, so that's nice to look out for. Yeah, that's nice. And then also, on the 21st, we've got Vesta, which reaches opposition and appears to shine at magnitude plus 6.3 among the stars of northern Orion. And on the 22nd, the Northern Hemisphere's winter solstice occurs at 0328 UT. So uh, that's... Their... There's, there's no point staying up for that, though, because the sun <laughs> will be below the horizon. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a nice long night, hopefully full of observing. And on the 27th, uh, that night into the following morning, Comet 62P Sushin Shan will pass through the Leo triplet. That's the three galaxies M65, M66 and NGC 3268. So that's quite a nice thing. The comet will be, uh, should be shining at a predicted brightness of about magnitude plus 7.2 as it does that. So that's something which would make a nice photograph as well. Yeah, that's going to be quite pretty and uh, always nice to have a bright comet. I do regard magnitude 7.2 as a bright comet because most of them, uh, bright comets we see are in about that range. So it'd be interesting if the if the comet does reach that magnitude, that'd be a nice few thing to look at. It's it's an interesting point, actually, because I have um, I came across this recently where somebody was um, talking about the... Um, the way astronomers promote comets, and they will say there's a bright comet about, mm. and they go, well, that's not very bright because it's you know you need binoculars or a small telescope. Well, most comets, I mean, there are a lot of them about all the time, but most of them are so faint you need a big telescope to pick them you up. Do. So anything that gets into small telescope or binocular range tends to be called a bright comet. But of course. For people that don't observe comets, they assume a bright comet is going to be one that glows away like Hale Bop or Neowise in the um, in the lockdown period, which is really easy to see with a naked eye. But that's not actually the case. So no. just bear that in mind. Yeah, and I, I think it's unfortunate that uh, this bias towards what we classify as a bright comet can put people off observing them because they think, well, it's quite faint magnitude. So from, well, yes and no. Don't forget a lot of deep sky things, Messier objects can be of a similar magnitude and a small telescope will show it and it is interesting to watch the comet change position night after night and watch how it evolves so yes i think we've got every reason to look forward to seeing 62p i'm not even going to try and remember how you pronounce the name please <laughs> <laughs> no i am i have to try yes shin shan i'm going to make an effort to shin shan yes we're going to, to do it. it's actually quite That's nice probably to... wrong anyway but <laughs> <laughs> quite it's actually quite nice to see a uh, a surname uh, attached to a comet because most of them now are discovered, like you say, Neowise. That's the name of a facility that the, the, that was looking for it. It's nice to see that the surname of some cometary observer who discovered it is attached to it. So, uh, but that's yes, a, that's, it is. That's a good thing. Well, it's it, it is interesting because we had um, one in uh, when was that? It was September period, yes, wasn't it? Which it was C two thousand twenty three P one Nishimura, and Nishimura was discovered by. Uh, Mr. Nishimura, and he picked it up because, or he beat the automating systems which look for these things. These, they're quite clever, actually, because they these automated facilities, they take a, a average shot of the whole of the night sky, and then they get, use that as a reference, and then over the next nights, they take high-resolution high resolution images of the entire night sky again and they subtract the first one from the the new ones and anything that remains is a transient event like yeah, so a comet quite clever. but of course i mean that's going to capture everything but of course they have their limitations because they can't go too close to the um the sun's glare yeah. so so this is where the clever uh, cometary finders there's an awful lot of japanese cometary finders they're very good at picking up comets the japanese um and they have been finding these comets in in that zone so they're beating the automated systems so it's rather nice as you say to see their names reappearing on the comets i think this is a hearty thing for amateur astronomy so uh, well done to all those dedicated comet observers who, who find them and beat yes. the automation okay the last uh, item really is just uh 
30th December. Today's sunrise is the latest of the year. So if you've been I out... shan't be looking for it. No, no. If you are out, been out for most of the night, you'll probably uh, be in bed by that point. So <laughs> some nice things to there. So let's move on into the night sky. And this is a good time of year for astronomy because the skies are dark for their longest period uh, at any time. So yes. uh, this is the month when the apparent position of the sun in the sky reaches its most southerly point, which is the December solstice. And then after this, the nights will start drawing back in. So uh, some good constellations. Where should we start? Where do we always start with winter constellations? The constellation of Orion, which is well-placed all of the month. So lots of deep sky riches in uh, in Orion, including the Orion Nebula, which is often observed. But there are lots of other things uh, in the Orion Nebula that you might miss if you don't take a proper look. Don't you agree? Well, yeah, you've got the Orion Nebula itself, which has got lots of detail in it. You've got M43, which is immediately next door yes. um, with the variable star at its centre, NU Orionis, which is rather confusing because the first time <laughs> you see it, you think it's New Orionis. It's not. It's NU Orionis. Um, and that looks like a bit like a comma. But then you've got clusters um, and other nebulosity in the sword of Orion. So you've got NGC 1980, which is a cluster, NGC 1981, which is another cluster, the Running Man Nebula, which is uh, 1977, if I remember correctly. Um, and then if you take the belt of Orion and you take the star, which is on the easternmost side, which is Ulnitak, and you rotate the belt around Ulnitak by 90 degrees anti-clockwise where the other end would end up that points directly to where you can see m78 which is another area of nebulosity it's rather lovely actually if you've ever seen it through a telescope it's got two stars in a sort of misty patch which always to me remind me of a car's headlights in <laughs> fog Oh, you do think of some poetic ways of describing these objects, don't you? Um, I'm going to look out for that now to see if it does look like two car headlights in the fog. You need to be careful because there's another region uh, just to the north of it, which people often confuse with M78. Um, I can't remember what that's called. I think it's NGC 2071, something like that. Um, but there are other things as well there. Uh, if you go back to Ulnitak, there's NGC 2024, which is the... Uh, the Flame Nebula, and that's quite large and reasonably bright, but it's right next to Ulnitak, which makes it really hard to see. Um, yeah, and it's, it, it, you've seen I, that. I have seen it, and I did it by taking Ulnitak just outside the field of view. Yes, <laughs> to reduce the, the glare from it. That was that was the I couldn't see it otherwise with Ulnitak. So Ulnitak's quite it's quite a blue star, and it's quite that's quite distracting. So Very distracting. You, you yes. have to get it get just out of the way to be able to see it. And then running south from that, you've got that curtain of um, bright emission uh, nebulosity there. And then there's a, the dark finger of obscuring material about halfway along it, which, if you take a photograph of it, looks a bit like the silhouette of a horse's head. And that's Barnard 33, the horse head nebula. And that used to be something I can remember when I was sort of growing up and with astronomy books and whatever, that it was sort of almost something which was untouchable yeah. for amateurs it was just so <laughs> faint that you just and now it's just sort of second nature isn't it people with imaging kit just pick it up all the time they go, oh here's another picture of the horse head yeah i'd still like <laughs> to see it visually actually um uh, even from a dark sky i've never i think you need a really dark sky and a really massive telescope to to see it visually is it's quite a challenge but if we... i tried with a, a 10 inch um from uh, my back garden in Selsey and I I was very dark adapted I could even detect when street lights were going off in other roads because the sky clarity was changing and I was wondering what it was and I realized <laughs> that that's what was occurring and I was on the threshold I could see some of the emission nebulosity but I could not see the horse head itself so a 10 inch for me was not viable but I would imagine if I'd gone up to a 12 inch I would have seen it. Yeah, it's, it's something worth trying if you if you have access to a large telescope in a, in a dark sky. But just going back to M42, the interesting thing about the Orion Nebula is how many structures there are inside it. Yes. Uh, 
that you can see. And when I recently looked at it with my my twelve inch telescope, I the, the what's interesting is how how firstly how many other small faint stars you can see in the nebulosity. Uh, the trapezium is quite bright, but there's lots of other structures in there like the fish mouth and yes. various structures like that. The sail is another part of it, uh, and it actually if you spend time looking at ten fifteen minutes. The more you look, the more you see of it. It's really quite an interesting object. Yeah, they. I mean, the the bright kidney shaped bit, which the trapezium uh, sits within, is called the thrust, and then the um, you've got the sail, which is one of the sweepback regions. I think that's the northern sweepback region, and then the southern one is called rather confusingly the sword. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. it's got a sharp edge to it. Yeah, it's uh, there's all these. It's quite good fun to uh, to make a drawing of it and identify all the regions uh, that that you can see afterwards. Well, another challenge there actually is the um, the sweepback regions. They they form part of a, of quite a large loop, and is to see how far around the loop you can follow it. Yes, well, located northeast of the trapezium and separated by the bright area uh, of M42 by a dark dust lane, as we've just said, is M43, this little comma-shaped nebula. Yeah. Uh, but there are a number of open clusters and other things in the night sky in this part of the night sky. Uh, what people may not know is that the belt of Orion itself is part of an open cluster called Colander 70. Yes, it is. And if you use binoculars to look into the belt region, and you'll see loads of stars there. So you're looking at a, a large uh, open cluster, basically. There's actually a region of nebulosity in the centre of that, and it's quite difficult to see, um, but it is there. And it's, it's also another thing worth mentioning, actually, while we're here, is the, is the Barnard's Loop, oh, which yes. is the giant emission loop, which sort of encircles a large part of Orion. And the, this is probably best seen with... Uh, long exposure photography of the entire constellation from a dark sky site. But you can see part of the loop visually, which is the bit just to the northeast of the belt. Right. I've never seen that. But then, I, I, actually, I don't think I've ever looked for it. I think you probably... I don't think my skies are dark enough for that. But uh, I would think you would struggle yeah. a bit. Yes. Okay. Well, the constellation of Orion isn't the only interesting constellation. Um, to the north, there are two stars which represent the horn tips of the constellation of Taurus the Bull. Um, the northern horn is is called uh, El Nath, and that used to belong to Auriga the Charioteer. Um, yes, it one did. One of those stars, a bit like uh, Alpha Rats, which got in, in the square of Pegasus that just got... So it seems to be arbitrarily shifted over to another constellation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, interestingly, the Elnath is is often shown in charts still connected to Auriga, um, so that sort of belies its history. Really, I think it was Gamma Aurigi. That's what it, uh, its designation was originally. But it's quite a prominent star, Elnath. And um, if you if you go to the south of it, of course, you've got the star. Zeta Origi, which is the southern bull's horn tip. And that has a name. It's a Chinese name, which I can never get right. It's something like Tiang Yan. Right. And, and it's, um, that's the gateway to the um, Crab Nebula, Messier 1. That's quite close to that star. It is, uh, although quite a, a bit of a challenge to see visually because uh, it's got quite a low surface brightness, but uh, it is a nice object to look at. Uh, the constellation we were just talking about, uh, Auriga, is dominated by Capella, which I think is a really beautiful star. Yes. Uh, beautiful yellow colour, yellow giant star. So it's, it's very, very pretty. Uh, and in Auriga, in fact, there are a number of lovely open clusters uh, because there's, these star clusters are scattered along the path of the Milky Way, uh, which follows this sort of pentagonal-shaped constellation. And I think three of the best are M36, M37 and M38. So uh, th those are easily found in a small telescope or indeed binoculars. Which I, which I always find amusing because M, it goes... If you go from the south, it's M37 first, and then M36 in the middle, <laughs> and then M38 at the top. And M38 is an interesting cluster because it sits at the corner of a curve shape which represents the, the mouth of the Cheshire Cat asterism. Right. Okay. 
I don't think I've ever you seen. You don't sound convinced. Well, I don't, I've never seen it, but I will take your your astronomical word for it, then, Pete. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, those clusters are actually also visible in binoculars. In fact, the first time I ever saw them was through binoculars, and binoculars yes. or a low power te- eyepiece on a telescope shows them best. Otherwise, you can't get all of the cluster into the eyepiece. Yeah. Well, between Auriga and the Pole Star. Uh, Polaris, there is one of the faintest constellations to make out, and that's the ill-defined shape of Camelopardalus. And um, you might think it represents a camel, but it actually represents a giraffe, and that's a reference to the fact that the ancients thought that uh, a giraffe was a cross between a camel and a leopard. (laughs) That makes perfect sense. Well, I mean, I guess if if you don't know any better, you know, maybe. Uh, I I actually should confess, I've, I've I never even looked into this constellation until about 10 years ago. I never even noticed its existence until I started making regular observations of two variable stars in this constellation, oh, yes. Zcam and Xcam, both of them quite different variable stars. Uh, I tried to find... The, I cheat now, I use GoTo. But back in the day... It you, would, you do what? I do. Oh, please, you do the same. <laughs> I do, I, I do not use no, GoTo. <laughs> you don't use GoTo because you're too tight to buy a GoTo system. But <laughs> if you do lots of lots of variable star observing, a GoTo system really does cut out the time. Because one of the things you find is it's very difficult to star hop in Camelopardalus because there's very few stars. Only if you're not very good. Oh, well, the- I mean, that's obviously what was going wrong <laughs> So yes, it is. There is actually a nice. There is a nice thing in. It's actually not far. I discovered, uh, not far from uh, these two variable stars I look at, and that is Kemble's Cascade. Oh yes, uh, that's lovely. And uh, that really is. I think this makes the constellation worthwhile, don't you? Oh yeah, without doubt. It's it's a rather beautiful. It's a line of stars, isn't it? Basically, which doesn't sound that exciting, but it's sort of got a brighter fifth magnitude star in its center. And it runs for about 2.3 degrees. And at its most southerly extreme, there's a sixth magnitude open cluster, NGC 1502. So it looks like the cascade is a waterfall going into the splash pool, which is the cluster. That's poetic, isn't it? It's very poetic. And what's interesting, some of the stars in the in the cascade are different colours. And I, I think that really did, it does make the whole thing look very, very pretty. So that's definitely worth, uh, definitely worth seeking out. And of course, the constellation is quite high up. So uh, it yes. is high up. And and if you're rubbish at working your way through Camelopardalus, like Paul is, <laughs> um, so basically what you need to do is to first locate the W shape of Cassiopeia. So if you then go from the star, imagine the W the right way up. So you go from the star, which is on the right-hand edge of the W, you draw a line from that all the way along to the star, which is on the left-hand edge of the W, and you extend that for the same distance again. And where that ends up will be at Kemble's Cascade. There you go, you see. Couldn't be easier. Couldn't be easier. You don't need a go-to. You just need Pete's long, verbose descriptions of these <laughs> objects in the night sky. Absolutely right, Paul. <laughs> well, I think we should take this time to wish all of our listeners a happy Christmas and happy New Year. Yes, and absolutely. hope you all have some clear skies over the Christmas period, and we will see you all in the January issue of the Virtual Planetarium. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Paul. <laughs>